Hi everyone. So I just want to talk a little bit about balance sheets. So a balance sheet summarizes what the household or firm owns and what it owes to other people. The assets are anything of value that is owned. Liabilities are anything of value that is owed to someone else. So debts you have towards other people. And then your net worth is your assets minus your liabilities. So the way that I like to think about net worth is um, something like imagine you own a home, but then you have a loan on that home. So the asset is your home, but then you have a loan or a mortgage on that home. So what that means then is that because of that loan that you have on the home, you've got that asset that is in your name, but then you have to pay the bank back um, for that thing that is your asset. And then so the asset minus the loan that you have on it, that's going into your total net worth, into which we add whatever other wealth that you also have. So... Using the example of Julia from class, where we had um, her indifference curves and the budget constraint or the feasible frontier, what we want to think about is two different sets of um, time, um, her now and later periods. So we've got now over here, and then we've got later over here. So starting with now, what we want to think about, and I'm just going to move myself around slightly, is we start off with the top half, where we think about um, Julia who has a loan for $58, um, and with that loan, she's then going to pay interest on that in the future. But right here, right now, she has a loan for $58, and that allows her to um, have $58 worth of cash. So you've got $58 worth of cash, and she has liabilities of $58. Now, her net worth is the $58 of cash that she has from the loan, minus the liability, which means her net worth is zero. Now, after she consumes that money now, she has nothing in her bank account, but she still owes $58. Her um, net worth is therefore minus $58. She owes the bank $58, um, and then she's going to also have to pay interest on that loan in the future. Now, in terms of what happens later before she consumes, we have to think that she gets the $100 worth of income. That's the money that she gets. And it's super responsive to my wrist for some reason. Um, she gets $100 worth of income. And then she has the loan on which she now has to pay interest. So she's got an interest payment of $6, which has been added onto that because of the interest um, rate. Now, what that means is that her net worth is the $100 minus the $64, which is $36. Okay. And that $36 is what she consumes in the later period, right? Now, in terms of what she then has after consuming the $36, she's got the $64 worth of cash after consuming the $36, but then she has the loan that she has to pay back, which is $64. And so the one minus the other is zero, and that means her net worth is zero. And so that's what we think about when we think about um, Julia having a choice about what to do between now and the future, and thinking about what's best. Um, in terms of what she can do. I'm just going to move up my... Uh, move myself up so you can see what I was doing over there. Okay, so you could see there that difference, the zero net worth, the $64 worth of um, cash, and she has to pay back the $64 loan, and therefore her net worth is zero. Now, how do we think about that in terms of banks? Well, we've got the bank's assets, and we've got the bank's liabilities. And the assets for a bank are its reserves, its loans to others, the securities that it might have. So those are stocks and bonds and these kinds of things. The cash that it has on hand. So those are its total assets. And then its liabilities are the deposits, because other people can take those out. Loans from the central bank that it has to repay. Loans from the interbank market. Um, other liabilities that it might have. Now we're going to think about this in terms of two potential banks. We've got Bank A and Bank B. And in thinking about Bank A and Bank B, um, we've got to think about Bank A being in the rural market and Bank B being in the urban market. That's going to be important um, in a moment for reasons that we'll see. Now, we're going to assume that both banks have the same amount of deposits. They both have deposits of £100. And we're just going to speak in hundreds, but obviously you could expand this by hundreds of thousands of pounds, hundreds of millions of pounds, however you want to talk about this. And then... As a consequence, we're also going to say that they have capital, 
um, banks raised equity um, capital of um, £10 each. Again, you could think about this as being thousands or millions if you'd rather think in that way. And so just the small numbers are just helpful for us to think about how this works. Now, um, what can each do, bank do with the, with the money that they've raised? So the first thing is that we have to assume that each bank needs to keep 10% um, of what they have from the deposits in reserves of the central bank. So they're 10% in terms of the of what they actually have as deposits need to be kept in reserves. That's to, like a rule that you might have with the central bank. So 10% of 10 is, of 100, sorry, is 10. So both of them have reserves of 10 at the central bank, both the um, rural bank and the urban bank. Now, um, what do we then say? Well, the two banks are different because um, what we see is that um, the urban bank has more profitable opportunities than the rural bank. So there's more opportunity to make money in the um, urban area, fewer opportunities to make money in the rural area. Therefore, um, the um, urban bank is going to make more loans, 90 worth of loans, 90 pounds, versus 50 pounds worth of loans for the urban bank. Now, this means then that um, Bank A is going to have more securities um, um, issued um, than the urban bank. So, rural bank, Bank A, rural, Bank B, urban, Bank B, the urban bank has more, security, more securities than it does loans, Bank A has um, um, also, uh, well, has, sorry, Yes, more, more, Bank B has more loans than it has securities, 90 versus 10. Bank A has loans of 50 versus securities of 30. So we contrast these two. We can see differences in the level of securities that they have, difference in the level of loans that they issue. Okay, now, let's say that Bank B finds another profitable project, but that requires a loan of 200 pounds. So what's that going to look like? Well, Bank B is going to issue a loan of 200 pounds and at the same time, credit the borrowers with cash of, or deposits of 200 pounds. So they make loans of 200 and then deposits of 200. So you wanna think about this as kind of like what happens when you um, kind of buy a car or buy a home. So what happens there is that the bank is like, is making a loan to you of that amount of money, however much it is. You then get that deposit in your account and then you give that money to the person um, from whom you're getting the loan, right? So like paying for the house, paying for the car after you've gotten the loan from the bank. Now, Bank B issued these new loans without having sufficient deposits. So no new deposit has come in and put 200 pounds worth of loans into the bank before they issued those loans to the person, to the people who wanted them, right? Um, so the new deposits uh, were created after the loans were issued, not before. So they issued the loans, and those loans then resulted in deposits being created, not deposits, then loans. Okay, um, so we have this example here of saying, like a home loan, um, your bank approves it and then credits your account with that amount of money, you then go and pay the person whose home you're buying. So, a summary here with respect to bank money is when banks issue new loans, they simultaneously create new deposits, the bank money, worth similar amounts. As such, Banks have created new money in the process of issuing new loans. Now that's fascinating. So um, Tobin, who went on to win a Nobel Prize in economics, he says that money created by the stroke of bank president's pen when he approves a loan and credits the borrower's checking account. Um, you can also see a com complimentary reading from the Bank of England about mod modern money creation. Um, so this little figure here summarizes exactly what we we're talking about. So we can think about um, assets um, that are um, non-money, and then we've got reserves and currency. Those give us base money at the central bank. Um, and then what we see here is that we've got new loans um, and new deposits, which are liabilities. Um, and those are going out the commercial banks. And then what happens with consumers? We have new deposits and new loans. So that's kind of showing the 
kind of correspondence between what's happening, what's happening with the commercial banks creating new loans, which then result in new deposits. Um, and then the consumers, us, on the other hand, have new deposits and engaging in new loans. Um, and we've got the assets and liabilities on either side for us. So the important thing here to notice is that the asset for the bank is the new loan that they have. They then have liabilities of new deposits. For us as consumers, those new deposits are our um, assets, but then we have the liabilities of the loans that we are then going to have to pay back to the bank. Okay, now, is it so simple? But can bank B do that? Well, depends. What if the borrower wants to make a payment or withdraw cash? All right, so bank B doesn't have enough reserves to facilitate that withdrawal of the cash. But if bank A agrees to lend bank B um, some money, then bank B can issue new loans. So what you want to think of here is that um, what's going to happen here is that there's going to be what we call interbank lending. So the rural bank um, lends to the urban bank. That's interbank lending. Um, now that has to take place via the bank's reserves. So what's going to happen there? You've got um, bank B who increases their reserves at the central bank. And um, what's occurring with bank A? Well, they've got these um, reserves from which they're subtracting. So the important thing to think about there is if we went back to um, look at bank A, um, I didn't flag this earlier because I wanted to bring it up again now, is bank A had additional reserves that they'd put in with the central bank, right? Now, um, bank B then is thinking, oh, I need that money as a loan. We're going to do this now through the central bank and this, these interbank loans. So bank B puts that um, money in with the central bank, Bank A has taken it out of the reserves that it had with the central bank and then is offering an interbank loan. And so we see that that um, loan now crops up for Bank uh, B on its liabilities. So um, a few things to note here that we're just trying to quickly summarize. We have um, the bank's willingness to lend. Um, this depends on a whole variety of ideas. I'm just going to move myself around. Um, so we've got the policy rate for the central bank. We've got the pro the probability of default and the riskiness of loans issued. We have um, the degree of information asymmetry. Um, so depending on how um, big that information asymmetry is between the different parties involved, um, the creditors and the, like, the borrowers and the lenders, that's a really important part of what we want to think about with like whether or not we're going to get paid back um, and so on. We've also got government regulation. So we mentioned that ratio, um, that 10% ratio of keeping reserves in with the central bank or the Bank of England or similar. That's really crucial here to think about what can go on. Um, with demand, um, so this is all supply side from what banks can provide, right? And then for us as borrowers, like people wanting um, loans from banks, um, now, that policy rate affects us because it's basically telling us something about the underlying price that we're going to be paying for um, our loans, right? It's The interest rate is basically telling us something about the price of money, right? Now, um, we also want to think about the expected returns that we might have on an underlying project. So, like, how much money am I going to make from, for some investment opportunity that I have that I want a loan from the bank for? So that's a really crucial variable here for my demand for a loan from the bank. Um, the other thing that's important is what is my expected income over time? Do I anticipate that my salary is going to go up? And therefore, if I borrow some more now to smooth my consumption say, over the next two years, but I anticipate that my salary is going to go up in years three, four, five, there might be reasonable ideas for why I would choose to do this. Um, you can think about this yourselves as students where you've taken out student loans in anticipation of getting a salary after you've graduated um, and that you anticipate that your income as a consequence of what the degree that you've chosen is going to be higher. Um, now, of course, your other government policies are going to affect this too. A whole variety of them that we could think about that would um, affect the taxes that you pay, the, the transfers that you anticipate receiving, um, whether they're going to be like government debt programs, um, these kinds of things that would affect what you choose to do. Um, and why might um, we not expect there to be too many loans? A whole variety of things that we could think would play into this. So the liquidity commitments of various banks, like how much liquidity they're expected to have um, in order to um, 
like how much cash on hand they have to have. That's the kind of thing you want to think about here. And so some discussion around the global financial crisis involved it being not just um, a home loan crisis, but was it also a liquidity crisis for um, the banks involved and for the insurance and companies involved, right? Um, then um, uh, fragile funding structures. So this relates to like the ways in which different banks and different um, companies are connected to each other. I'm happy to um, answer more questions about this in class. And so like the question here is kind of about what folks theorize is like contagion around um, or across different banks. Um, the degree to which banks are leveraged or lenders are leveraged. Like that means like how much debt they have and what they're doing with that debt. Um, and then also the kinds of regulation that are involved. So um, we think here, um, when it comes goes back to the global financial crisis, which I'll comment on more later, this question of um, like how regulation, observation, and monitoring um, exists of the kinds of financial transactions that can occur, um, the expectations around um, how much, going back to this question of um, government regulation here and the earnings to loan ratio and the ratio for housing loans, um, like how much you have to say provide for a housing loan. Um, so if we think about loans just prior to the financial crisis and people getting very low interest rates without providing any equity on their homes, that's like that's a question that regulation could be involved in too. So we're going to stop there when talking about these questions of assets, liabilities, and balance sheets. And we're going to come back to talking at another point in time about credit constraints um, and also about um, the different kinds of variables that are going to be affected when we think about banks and money.